All right. All right, so let's get started today. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to um, Bold Chats. Uh, today is number 12, and we're very lucky to have um, Stanford Thompson with us, with us today. Um, just a little reminder, Brass Out Loud, um, we do have our website, brassoutloud.com, if you're interested in following our events and everything that we're putting on right now. But we're just going to jump to it and get right in. Um, so Stanford, uh, we are very happy to have you here today. And we were hoping that you could just talk to us a little bit about your upbringing and your career as a performer to start. Sure. So Rebecca, Kate, great to be here and love the work that you all are doing um, with these chats. So. Um, you know, my story goes back to my parents who are both retired music educators um, and growing up in a big household in Atlanta uh, with seven other siblings. Uh, I'm number seven out of eight, but we all played music pretty much at some point and at the same time. Um, and, you know, my house growing up, we kind of had the, the jazz side of the family, we would call it, that played trumpet and percussion, drums, uh, bass and saxophone. And then we kind of had the boring side of the family that played violin and viola and cello and piano. Um, so the jazz side of the family, we all decided that we wanted to go into music professionally, I think from a pretty young age. And then the other side, the boring side of the family, they all kind of decided they wanted to be real human beings and make real money and be happy, that type of thing. So. Um, uh, so I started playing trumpet when I was eight years old. I really wanted to play trombone. Uh, my dad told me my arms were too short, but I didn't find out until I was in college that he only had an extra trumpet in his uh, band room closet. He didn't have an extra trombone. Um, and um, probably when, I mean, he was my first teacher. We sat down pretty much every day for at least half an hour. Uh, buzzing on the mouthpiece, um, you know, learning musical literacy, um, long tones, lots and lots and lots of long tones. Um, and then probably when I was around 10 or 11, I started studying with uh, Dr. Gordon Vernick, who heads up the jazz department at Georgia State University. Um, and we went through the Arbens and Schlossberg and Irons and Clarks, all that stuff. Um, and then um, it wasn't until eighth grade that Chris Martin moved to town and I studied with him and Joseph Walthall of the Atlanta Symphony from eighth grade to the time that I graduated from high school. Um, and I think it was probably when I was like 14 or 15, that's when I decided I really wanted to um, be a professional musician, started practicing a bunch, um, taught all my friends that I wasn't gonna hang out with them, that type of thing. Um, and um, had some really good guidance and support to help me get into the Curtis Institute of Music where I got my bachelor's in trumpet performance, studying with Dave Bilger there. Um, uh, so that's really in a nutshell, um, you know, what happened over the years and just very, very lucky to, to be in some uh, great, places at the right time, uh, work with some really good teachers, and of course have the support of my parents and my family. I love that. That really means the most, I think, to you know everyone as students and teachers to have that great community around you. So my next question is kind of a two-parter. So what inspired you to create Play on Philly? And then what advice would you have if you have any to young people who are trying to do anything entrepreneurial of their own? Sure. So, uh, I mean, for me, Play on Philly started as um, a lot of things that I was doing in high school. I teamed up with some of my high school trumpet buddies. We created the Atlanta Trumpet Festival um, at Emory University. Um, in college, I created a summer camp in Reading, Pennsylvania, about an hour and a half, two hours north of Philly, northish. Um, and also uh, ran a program for the brass students in the school district um, that Curtis hosted. So there was a lot of kind of like smaller projects that I was doing, um, which will tie into kind of the second part of this question in a moment. Um, but what really kind of led to Play on Philly was my very last 
semester in college, um, I learned about the El Sistema program of Venezuela. That's when Gustavo Dudamel was named the music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. The founder of El Sistema, Jose Antonio Abreu, won the TED Prize and he gave a TED Talk. Um, and just learning about what they were doing, it just kind of brought me back to my experience in music, especially in classical music. Um, and that's really what inspired me to like really say, how do I take kind of my life experiences, my musical experiences, and then even the entrepreneurial ones of uh, starting programs and kind of like tie it all together. I never thought though, when I was 22 years old and leaving college that it would blow up into what Plan on Philly has become. Um, but I think there was just a lot of kind of raw ingredients that were there um, for me to work with. So um, I think, the advice that I would give to people kind of wanting to do their own thing is, is a chapter, I guess, out of, out of my playbook with Play on Philly, um, that I think, you know, a couple of things that I would say is just kind of recognize the networks uh, and the people around you and build lots of relationships. Um, I think about, you know, my time at Curtis, for example, it's like, you know, the old couple that comes up or came up to me after a concert um, to say congratulations there was an opportunity to ask them more information about themselves um, to get to know them and it just ended up being that you know the husband's a billionaire and um, uh, you know they like to support lots of music programs throughout the city um, I also think about the staff members at Curtis, um, the orchestra manager, um, the people that work in the fundraising office, the financial aid and admissions office. Um, these were all people that I was building relationships with as a student that then helped later on if I needed some marketing advice or how to read a balance sheet, um, or perhaps are there some people locally that might like my idea and want to support it? or can you get me connected to this other organization or to this venue, the list goes on and on. If you have those relationships, you know, I learned uh, back then that that is what, you know, really propelled Play on Philly in its early years. And it's something that still continues to propel us. Um, so I would certainly say, you know, really think about the people around you um, going to school with, for example, Ray Chen or Yuja Wong, I didn't know at the time they would become Yuja Wong or Ray Chen, as we know. Um, I think about my buddies that are in major orchestras. Um, and, you know, at, at the time, I didn't think that they could be resources, that they could be future connections. So uh, I think it's just a combination of, um, you know, realizing the people that are around you today. Um, the ideas that you have, sharing those ideas with other people, and being willing to listen to others' advice um, on how those ideas shape up and how you find the resources to make those things happen. I think that that is some really key advice that you had just offered, um, especially about you know moving forward kind of more and so in the entrepreneurial field is that your colleagues are the people who are going to kind of like ride the wave with you who are going to you know be those people that you can bounce ideas off of and kind of grow with so I really admire you sharing that piece of advice because I think it's something that people really need to need to hear sometimes rather than having such a competitive mindset yeah and you know just to add really quickly to it I mean I think it's it's just so easy to go into a situation especially studying music in school, uh, you know, you're so busy and just thinking about the next lesson, the next coaching or rehearsal. Um, and it can be very easy to kind of lose sight of the future. I mean, we all worry about the future because we know we're going to be thrown into the real world. We want to win auditions or competitions um, and, you know, want to be able to sustain ourselves. Um, you know, performing music, um, performing for other people, that type of thing. So I just think that, you know, to take a moment and to like truly think about where one wants to land. Um, and for many years, I thought it was gonna be in the back of an orchestra. 
Um, but once I got into <laughs> an orchestra, it was just like, ah, oh, this is not really me. This really doesn't build upon my values. It doesn't give me a ton of energy. Sure, I can be good at doing this, but um, so anyway, a lot of those feelings and kind of thoughts and uh, going on, it's also good to realize what else is out there in the world and you know have some of the skills to go after those things. That's awesome. And thank you for sharing that. Um, kind of a little bit of a shift, but kind of almost along the same lines. Um, you are a strong advocate for diversity in music um, and some things to think about, but in, in your opinion and in, in your you know experiences, how do you think that we can encourage orchestras and other organizations to create more diverse um, environments? Oh, this is a huge question. Um, I think one is for a lot of organizations, um, institutions, they can be orchestras, they can be conservatories, summer festivals or summer camps, or, um, training orchestras or, you know, training type situations or um, even professional, other professional groups that are not necessarily symphony orchestras. I think first, I mean, just need to realize the type of institution that they want to be for their musicians and be for their community and the people that are coming out for concerts. Um, I think there's a lot of strength in having a diversity of ideas around the table, uh, skill sets, people that just look at situations different um, rather than the same types of people that end up coming up with the same types of ideas. Um, and I think at a time where we really wanna bring more people into um, what orchestras do, classical music, um, I think that's a very important question to ask. The other one is you know, around equity. What does that look like um, and not from a standpoint of just checking the boxes, but what does that really mean in a kind of a systemic way um, that's really ingrained in the institution? So what I mean by that, it's easy to say, well, let's program more music by black and brown composers. Um, let's bring in more black and brown soloists, uh, maybe even conductors. That's, that's really easy to do um, because the world is full of really, really talented conductors and composers and soloists that really deserve to be in, you know, on the stage. But what about from a systemic way? So for example, with an orchestra, it's easy to keep audition um, requirements and the whole audition process the way that it is um, without realizing that people come to that audition with various level of understanding and support. Um, and, you know, it ends up re rewarding the same types of people um, that excel in these spaces. So uh, I'll give you an example of this. Um, there's a huge difference between, let's say a graduate of a conservatory who has the financial security to stay in shape and go and do auditions versus someone, let's say from a socioeconomic standpoint that doesn't have a lot of money, that has to work two or three jobs, that is gigging as much as they can to make ends meet. And again, when these two musicians show up for the audition, just imagine which one is going to be better prepared. Um, and the types of musicians that can sustain that work of doing several auditions, maybe over many years before they win a job. Um, so there's, you know, those types of um, things to think about. And again, it's easy for the orchestra to say, show up on November 11th to do our audition. This is what you have to play, good luck. You know, we're gonna pick the best person. Um, so I think there's a lot of work there uh, that can be done. Um, and of course, a lot of work internally. The story is the same for board members that come to the table, staff members. Um, and to really think about, you know, what type of work might the organization need to do to bring in a different cast of characters and support them um, so that they can be successful in the space which then makes the entire organization successful. 
Um, and I think there's other things for um, organizations to just understand their bias, um, how that plays into how they bring people into the space. Um, I think organizations should be thinking about how they kind of create environments of belonging so that people from different cultural backgrounds that are not the norm can really feel accepted and feel safe in the spaces that currently exist. Um, and I think lastly, I would say that, um, that organizations need to simply believe that there is a lot of diversity out there um, that they're not tapping into at this moment. Um, and that it is possible to be in a different place. That's awesome. Um, and I think that that's some really great advice that you've offered about orchestras and even about um, different types of organizations and viewpoints and everything like that. Um, I know that for orchestras, everybody always talks about like the blind auditions and keeping everything blind, but I think that you're viewpoint of it and you know everything that you had just said really is more important than just keeping a screen up all the time you know taking into consideration like where people come from and like every everything you just said I so I think I you know thank you so much for bringing awareness to that I think that that's something that everybody needs to just hear in today's day and age and I love that you made it and that it's just not about just diversity. It's not about just bringing more of these voices into the room and that really taking it back and examining the whole problem and what we can all do, us as people and us as organizations, um, it, means, it means so much. So um, zooming in a little bit, uh, we are wondering since a lot of our audience is young students and then also teachers who are encountering young students, we are wondering if you have any advice for young students right now and young musicians who are sort of on the beginning of their careers. So, I mean, I have to acknowledge, um, you know, hopefully being at the tail end of the health crisis of the pandemic is much, much different. There's no playbook for what is happening. And I wanna be really careful that, um, uh, that I acknowledge that the climate is much different today. It is extremely difficult um, as hopefully organizations continue to open back up and provide concerts and you know opportunities for uh, musicians. Um, I also don't wanna compare this to when I graduated from Curtis in 2009 at the tail end of the Great Recession because um, these are certainly two different uh, beasts. But I think there's a couple of things that are similar, which is I remember feeling a lot of fear um, about what our field was going to become, how I would find a place in it, um, where would I find a sustainable career. Um, and I just remember how you know, in hindsight, I remember how destructive kind of that line of thinking was. Um, so I think that my number one thing would be to really think about what types of opportunities exist these days that did not exist a year and a half ago before the pandemic started. So for example, there are huge opportunities in how music is transmitted to people. Um, and think about, you know, digitally, we were forced to collaborate with one another over vast distances um, to plan projects, to um, actually even put them together if we were recording our individual parts. But I'm just curious, what type of literally global collaboration can we have among musicians or maybe even other artists that we just weren't really open to thinking about before Zoom took over all of our lives. Um, I think that there are really big opportunities there that can work in balance to live in-person performances um, that I think we are all kind of used to and I think we're all kind of dying to get back to. Um, the other thing that I think about is just, you know, how, um, how network, um, networking is happening, how it's being prioritized. Um, and I would just say that 
you know, in a kind of a crisis that we just went through, what I saw a lot were networks being activated. And in some cases for the very first time, um, people that were reconnecting um, over kind of great distances and also reconnecting over kind of great separations of time um, to check in on one another, see how people were doing. Um, I was also heartened to see so many new collaborative projects. I think some people finally looked in the mirror and just were like, I've been like hitting my head against this wall forever. And now that I have no wall to hit my head on, I can kind of like clearly see and think that perhaps with my talents, I can apply them in some other ways. It was great seeing how many people really kind of fell in love with teaching because all of a sudden, this was one of the things that we all could rely on. Um, and I do hope that in person, a lot of these folks will spend time locally face-to-face -face with young people, old people, everybody in between um, to help people connect with the musical process in a really meaningful way. Um, and I would certainly say um, the last piece to this to you know, anybody is really to add value in other people's lives, to like seek that. And I think that's one of the most kind of sil beautiful silver linings that came out of the pandemic, watching people add value into others' lives. If it was volunteering at a food bank, um, but perhaps being a bit more thoughtful musically um, to what was possible considering I think everything that happened, especially here in the United States around racial equity, um, which opened up so many conversations about not only how um, uh, uh, Black people have been, um, uh, gosh, experiencing the world, but we also had similar conversations about Asian Americans um, and how they also navigate the world as well. And I think about so many other cultural groups, um, LGBT groups, um, those from different social economic um, or geographical um, points of view. Um, you know, how do we look at rural America? And I think new ways, exciting ways actually, to help kind of build some collaboration. Do we really need to take our ensembles to New York or DC to perform? Or can we take them to rural Pennsylvania, um, rural Virginia? And can we create some new kind of dialogues in those spaces um, that can help people, I think, realize that we're pretty much in the same boat. We're just paddling in different directions in many ways. Um, so I would certainly say that I think this is a very, very exciting time to rethink so many rules, especially all the old garbage rules um, and expectations. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity to create new communities, um, you know, around music and around the arts in really powerful ways. Um, and, you know, I also think that there are tremendous opportunities for us to um, really kind of put our values um, uh, forward, um, I think, to kind of lead um, make music in different ways, make connections with people in really kind of powerful ways as well, so. Thank you so much. I think that that's a very encouraging and supportive um, message to send to students um, and even those, you know, in the pre-professional route to um, pursuing a career in music. So. We do have a little bit of a bonus question. We were wondering if you could tell us about your favorite experience, maybe a favorite memory of either being a performer, the founder of Play on Philly, or even just, you know, maybe a fond memory that you have of, you know, growing up with a family of musicians or something that maybe has, um, you know, energized you in your career path. I think, the thread through everything has always been in watching and experiencing performances. Um, I will never forget the Atlanta Symphony Youth Orchestra um, traveling to perform with the Berlin Youth Symphony, um, but sitting in the uh, 
Philharmonic, um, watching Claudia Abado conduct the Berlin Philharmonic and Mahler's Sixth Symphony. Um, and I was able to sit in the choir seats right behind the orchestra, close enough that I could lean forward and touch the bass drum if I wanted. Now, some people would say sitting right behind the bass drum might not be the best seat in a piece like that. Um, however, it really felt like I was in the orchestra. Um, I remember my summers at Interlochen, um, all, all of those summers of hearing really, really great music, but I think developing a really um, deep relationship with a lot of people, um, the constant performances of my kids, watching their parents with their, with their phones, taking photos and videos, watching the kids afterwards, you know, I always would love to hear a parent say, hey, you know, go get your horn, go get your cello, so that the instrument was part of the photo with their family. Um, I think there are so many of these um, instances. Um, and I'm hearing Winton and Jazz at Lincoln Center, somebody so knowledgeable about music and life and art um, that is also funny. Um, and also, you know, an authority makes everything look, him and his band makes everything look, you know, just so good. Um, so I think all of those moments of being inspired through performance, I think that is really um, what kind of keeps me going. Um, even the instances I've had of really great musical moments where it's almost like a spiritual like experience. Um, that kind of takes your mind and your body just completely away from everything else you're worried about and just able to like really live in that moment. So um, I would certainly say those are some of the, some of them, I mean, to, to find one, I think on the spot's a little challenging, but it would most likely be a performance somehow that changed my life, that changed the lives of other people or perhaps even the kids that I work with. Those are all great ones though. Oh my gosh, and so different. Um, I think that's also a really good thing for everyone watching eventually to hear that our careers are comprised of so many amazing moments, you know, like years ago, but also in the future from all the different avenues of what we do. It's not just like that one gig at Carnegie Hall or something, you know, so many of these things have meaning, which I love. I don't think we have any um, official questions next, but I wanted to ask a quick bonus question, if that's okay, sure. that we didn't um, let you know ahead of time. So I've been really lucky to teach for a couple of El Sistema organizations, one in Baltimore and then one in here in New York City. And one thing that I've noticed is that oftentimes people who are coming straight from conservatory or straight from school and then encountering these different communities and teaching often for the first time have a have a lot of trouble connecting with the students especially if there's differences in backgrounds and things like that and so I was wondering if you have any insights about that and how young people in general or people teaching for the first time how we can be better teachers and better um, just engage with students of all backgrounds both musically and also like personally all right so it's very similar to performing, you know, it doesn't mean that if you have the technique and facility that you can communicate effectively musically. I think it's very similar that even if you have all the knowledge of what the music is and the notes are, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are good at, you know, transferring that knowledge to other people. And what I mean by transferring the knowledge is doing it in a way that engages the kids, you know, uh, there's some structure around it. You know, of course the kids aren't jumping off the walls, um, but they're really, really engaged and involved in what they're learning, internalizing that. So then they can, in the future, go back and think for themselves. So I would say that one of the most important things is I think just to humble oneself as much as we know and stuff that we've been trained on um, to keep in mind that a lot of times we are so far away from where the kids we're working with are picking up for the very first time. Um, and knowing that that is a, um, it's a new language. I mean, they're getting used to how the instrument feels on their body or their face or under their chin, whatever it is. Um, so there are a lot of things to, I think, you know, understand from that perspective. Um, from a pedagogical standpoint, 
there are some important things to learn pedagogically <laughs> that even if I know how to create a buzz and I know the fingering chart, all that stuff, again, trying to really help a young person go through that process for the first time or at a particular part of their musical development, um, that a lot of times um, seeking help from those you know, around you um, can go a long way. And I think the last piece that I would say is um, being genuine, um, just being really curious about the young people that you're working with, being respectful, but also being a little bit firm. Um, and um, I think just kind of um, understanding that what you teach is also a re reflection of yourself. Um, and I think, you know, just bringing bringing your real self to the table, not trying to be weird or phony or act in a way you think the kids might like or not. I mean, if you're a geek, be a geek. Um, you know, if you're a cool person, be a cool kind of laid back person, but you still have to have, again, I think the firmness and the knowledge um, and also I think some of the experiences and just realize some of that comes with time, but all of it comes with time and effort. Um, so there's always a way to get better. And I think those that go into teaching situations humble and thinking about how they can keep growing class after class, semester after semester, maybe year after year, um, I've always seen the most positive results um, out of those people and then tremendous impact that they can have on the people that they're teaching. It's definitely, oh, Kate, did you want to say something? Because you asked the question. I, say, I love that. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Yes, um, definitely agree with Kate. It's some really great advice. So um, we're just about to wrap up, but we have one last question for you. We ask all of our um, people who we have on the bowl chats this very last question, and it is absolutely up to your interpretation um, when we ask this. So um, our question to you is, what does your ideal brass community look like? Oh, wow. Um, my ideal brass community is one that embraces, I think, so many more people than just like white dudes. Um, there is so much. Um, there, there's so many great people that are doing like incredible work in many different genres of music that just really enjoy having a piece of plumbing connected to their face. Um, and I think a community that is much more inclusive, um, that really um, doesn't just prop up those who learn how to play really fast or high or loud or something, um, but really understanding that I think everybody's bringing something uh, to the table. I think a brass community that supports one another, um, that is really safe and free from any type of harassment, um, that are teaching young people to be much, much more respectful. It is not cool to be the group on the back of the orchestra that can say and do whatever they wanna say and do. I don't think that's cool anymore. Um, I don't ever, well, I never thought it was cool um, to be that way. Um, and, you know, hopefully a, a community that realizes that um, by helping everybody succeed and everybody to shine, um, it is certainly a perfect example of what can happen uh, when you let all the boats rise in that sense. So um, I think that what you all are doing with these chats, I think embodies um, bringing so many voices forward. Um, and I think giving uh, people a platform to talk about their ideas and hopefully some of this stuff inspires others to go. Um, and I think kind of create a new world that's free of like all the clicks and broness and all that stuff. And I think one that is just much more vibrant. And I think it's going to be folks like y'all who create these new spaces that really um, helps the existing spaces really question themselves. 
Um, so anyway, I would just wanna say, just keep up this great work um, and keep building this community that you all are building. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing um, what your ideal brass community looks like. I, I know it's a very vague question and we kind of keep it like that for a reason because we just want to know, you know, your thoughts, feelings and interpretations. Um, so with that being said, um, thank you so much Stanford Thompson for being here with us today. If anybody is interested in following him or what he does, we will have um, the link to Play on Philly as well as his website in the description below. Um, this video will be up on Facebook as well as YouTube um, for anybody who has missed anything that they want to catch up on. And once again, if you're interested in anything Brass Out Loud related, you can follow us on Instagram at BrassOutLoud.com or Brass Out Loud, um, and then our website, BrassOutLoud.com. So with that being said, um, thank you again, and thank you for being with, here with us today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you so much.